what I'm going to talk about, and I struggled a little bit being invited here to see how I fit with this context of geography or space, and uh, because my my research tends to focus on processes of institutional change, uh, primarily in the empirical context of the professions, uh, but after a little struggling, I thought what what this is really about that connects it to geography is I'm looking at. Uh, the, the, the movement of a professional category, the historian, from one space, the university, to another space, the corporation. And uh, in that context, uh, I, 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 I think that I have at least a marginal connection to the idea of space. Uh, you guys will probably disagree with me. But l let me context in a second how this fits with my broader program of research, but I've I've been doing a lot of uh, hanging around of Fortune 500 companies over the last 10 years now uh, for, uh, for a broad range of issues. Oh, I should also warn you that I get my youngest daughter to uh, prepare my slides, and they're often surprised pictures here. My broader program of research is to try and understand fundamental change in institutions. And by institutions in this context, I, I would not say that COLA is an institution, it's an organization, but the idea of a corporation is pretty clearly an institution. And my program of research is to understand how the corporation as an ascendant, soon to be a dominant institution, is changing. The phrase that I've been uh, operating is, is this idea of institutional homology, and that is increasingly I notice that the, the modern corporation, particularly the Fortune 500 corporation, is appropriating elements of the nation state. And it's doing that because of neoliberal policies, there is a vacuum in certain functions in, in, in the nation state, and uh, as a result the corporation is engaging in behaviors that in the language of organizational institutionalism is not economically rational. It doesn't have an obvious bottom line benefit. And for an institutional theorist, that is inherently interesting. So I started out uh, looking at collections. Uh, context there is that I was to do some consulting work for uh, a Fortune 500 company in Iowa, where I was uh, then employed, John Deere Corporation. I, I went inside their world headquarters in the middle of a cornfield in Moline, Illinois. Fantastic place. Amazed to find that they had one of the best contemporary art collections I've ever seen in the world. And in my naive way, I asked them, how much does this cost? How much does that cost? And they won't tell me how much it costs. But it raises the question of how they justify this to their shareholders. In the context of that conversation, uh, I, I, I asked who, they, they all have professional curators. Who does the curator report to in the hierarchy? The answer is that they, they to the corporate historian. I said, what? You have a, a corporate historian. So with a former student, we now have uh, the pleasure of research money from the Canadian government to follow corporate historians around and ask them what is they do. And the short answer is uh, th they, they engage in a whole range of activities uh, that are, are designed to use history strategically. Uh, that is, they use history to engage with their uh, uh, with their employees. They use history to uh, facilitate uh, technological innovation. I'll, I'll explain in a second what I mean by that. Uh, they use history to uh, engage in with their marketing department in strategic planning. Uh, they describe themselves as strategic storytellers or uh, w we've appropriated the phrase mnemonic entrepreneurs. They use uh, memory as a strategic resource for, for the corporation. My real interest here is in what the heck are corporations doing with, by, by, by reinstating a new, I'm sorry, an old profession in a new uh, institutional context. Let me put a, a, a very um, personal face on this. This is, the, this is John Mooney, the, the young man in the middle here. John Mooney is the godfather of Fortune 500 corporate historians. He just retired about two years ago, but he was the head corporate historian at uh, Coca-Cola Company. Coca-Cola Company employs about a half dozen PhDs in history, and uh, uh, Phil Mooney has a direct line of reporting to the CEO. Uh, he can uh, spend in dollars without having had that approved. 
and uh, he is uh, considered by all of the other corporate historians that we've talked to to be the go-to guy as to uh, the training and uh, strategic uh, planning for uh, corporate historians. Interesting about Coca-Cola is that in this company, the corporate historian is very, very strongly aligned with the marketing department. That isn't necessarily true at other corporations. So at Motorola Corporation, the corporate historian is very strongly aligned with their innovation department and their engineering group. This context is that the corporate historian is uh, contrasted to the traditional historian. And the traditional historian has grown up and evolved and become formalized and institutionalized in a different institutional context, and that is the context of the university. And I'm playing on a, a, a broader argument here about an intimate relationship between professionals and institutions. That is, they have a symbiotic relationship that uh, professionals, professions are of course institutions themselves, which complicates it a bit, but professionals uh, have this ability to uh, use institutions for their own profession, to, to further their own professional project while helping the institution itself move forward. And I'll, I'll come back when I, when I discuss uh, in the context of, of the theoretical conclusions that I have here what, what exactly I mean by that. But I do have a whole range of, of questions about why this phenomenon of the corporate historian exists. I want to know, first of all, why this occupation emerged, how it emerged, and, and then particularly, I want to understand why the occupational category emerged now, roughly in about the 1980s, rather than uh, consistently with the formation of the corporation. Why didn't they have corporate historians 100 years ago? Because we had corporations. What are the implications for the production of history? So let's do this decade by decade. And I'm not talking about corporations having archives. They've always had archives. And they've always had curators. Here I'm talking about a formal role within the organization that has some recognition on the organizational chart. And the very first one is, I, I've got to be very precise on my dates here, Firestone uh, Tire and Rubber Company established their first historian in nineteen forty three fellow called William D very influential man um, Armstrong Cork a uh, total of five organiz five uh, large significant corporations now keep in mind a lot of the the, the corporations at that time also have museums so by the statistics you have about eighty large corporations in the United States with in-house museums, but only five of them with this educational role formalized. Equally large, if not larger, corporations. So here we have Coca-Cola uh, founded, uh, New York Life, Eli Lilly, Sears Roebuck, Ford Corp. In spite of Henry Ford's famous statement that history is bunk, he uh, also formalized the role of, uh, uh, or so it would have been in his... Uh, his son uh, formalized the role in, in Ford Corporation. So by the end of, of uh, a survey done in 1958, the American Historical Association shows that 12 large companies had formalized roles for professional historians on staff uh, at, that, at that point. Now, Overman, who, uh, if you recall, was the, was the um, historian at Firestone. He is now the president of the uh, Society of American Archivists and Historical Association. And, and in his inaugural speech, he had admonished ad the, the corporate America for not doing more of this. He's, he's pushing this project forward in a big way. And he says, there are hundreds of corporations with the resources to create professional archives, but they need to be persuaded that a program for the proper care of their permanent records will pay them dividends in the long run. That last phrase is critically important because here you see a shift in the logic of the essence of the historian. It is not collecting data and historical artifacts for its own sake, it is for improving the profits of the corporation. I'm going to come back to that point again and again because you start to see this union of economic logics with uh, the, the, the practice of uh, collecting archives. Interesting phenomenon, 1960s are kind of the doldrums. We, we now have about 12 
major corporations over the last 20 years that have formalized this role, and only two more get added in the 1960s. This is particularly interesting to me because the 1960s was an era of unprecedented profitability for American corporations. The, the economists would argue, or will argue, and have told me that the only reason companies do this is that it's lack resources. They're making lots of money. Well, that logic doesn't doesn't account for the fact that the, the decade in which they are the richest that they've ever been and probably ever will be, they, they don't expand this. I don't really have an answer for why that, why that, that uh, project is not expanded, but what we see is that by the 1970s it uh, takes off. There is a massive, massive renaissance of companies that have established their, their archive, their, their uh, archive programs. And in a second, I'm going to dig into one of these, the Wells Fargo, because it, it offers some interesting uh, contextual information about the motivation for, for why they did it. And I'm sure you, like uh, I was when I started going through this data, is um, what, what really is the motivation for the companies doing this? 1979 was a, uh, an important watershed event, and it's interesting because it happened outside of the context of the, of the um, uh, for-profit corporation. Consulting company gets formed. It's a consulting company that uh, uh, is based in, uh, just outside of Washington, D.C., in, in Virginia, and it is organized by a bunch of uh, uh, PhDs in history, and they call themselves the history factory, and they use for the first time this phrase heritage management. They are a heritage management company, and they are not just helping you collect and uh, categorize your archives. Their interest is in using your history as a strategic competitive resource. And they argue that if you don't have a history, we will make one up for you. I would encourage you, if you have the time, to go to the heritage uh, Heritage fa or the History Factory still exists to this day, and they have the absolute most fascinating website that, that, that you can imagine. But this idea it then emerges, and, and this is another point that I'm going to keep coming back to, is that when history moves from the context of uh, academia to the context of the corporation, they, they lose this essence core of their professional project of being about objectivity. It's not about objectivity now. It's about making money. It's about telling stories. It's about using history as the raw material to do other things. And it's also about having an increasingly, f uh, an increasingly important focus on the present and the future rather than just the past. And, and this may sound a little surprising and a little may, may, may make you feel a little um, awkward about the, about the um, character or the essence of, of the, uh, the profession of historians. Um, but, but I question, and I'll, I'll come back to this one as well, about how objective the history of the traditional historians produced in, in universities actually was. L let's dig in a little bit more deeply to uh, Wells Fargo, because this is a very interesting case. And Wells Fargo, as you, as you may know, uh, established in, in um, San Francisco in 18... Two starts out as a stagecoach company, and through a fascinating story in and of itself, uh, they transform themselves into one of the largest banks in the United States, if 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 not the world. Um, they established their um, the, the the context in which they establish their. Uh, history department and, and start hiring their corporate historian. Uh, and here's an interesting phrase. Following a review and recommendation of a special history task force appointed by senior management, Wells Fargo concluded that its history was a unique corporate asset that needed to be administered with the same care that its financial assets received. Consequently, the company set up a history department staffed by professional historians, archivists, museum and exhibit specialists, and stagecoach drivers, which is a, a, an interesting nod to, to the actual history of the company. The story is that this was based on the recommendation of the dean of Stanford Business School, a guy called Ernest Arbuckle, who also happened to be the chairman of the board of the company. And the argument that he gave was that the, the role of the corporate historian was to ensure the integrity of the company history, to uh, uh, create a major research center, academics who might be interested in the company, that's quite traditional. 
in, in terms of the context of uh, historical practices. But the third criteria was to provide support for all internal departments. And the detail that they get into in that context is uh, really about shifting the logic of the historian to, uh, uh, or the, the logic of history uh, to become a, a competitive asset of the firm that, that ought to be exploited. Today, this, this notion of history as a critical, important uh, uh, element of strategic planning and, and competitive positioning is uh, particularly evident in uh, the popular business press. So they now talk quite openly in uh, popular business press books about the corporate history as being part of the corporate DNA of uh, the organization. This is, this is uh, an American publication, of course. Uh, German companies and uh, companies based in the Netherlands have taken this to a whole new level, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that toward, uh, toward the end, because in, particularly in Germany, the, the uh, ability to rhetorically manage history has uh, gotten some very, very large German companies into some big, big trouble. Question I have, though, is why is this going on? What what, what happened in the 1980s that caused this profession to start shifting? And if you read the institutional theory in management, you'll understand that the corporation as a dominant institution is now generating its own professional categories. So the emergence of HR professionals, the emergence of, of folks who, uh, uh, Lauren Edelman talks about the emergence of uh, uh, gender specialists. That, that is an activity that uh, comes out of the corporation. We start seeing those activities uh, happen. HR starts occurring uh, right about the t time of the Second World War, and uh, the, the gender professionals start coming out in the late 1970s in, in U.S. companies. Why 1980s and why, why uh, history in particular? So the argument that's offered by the historian, or the, 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 the two on the... the uh, uh, right-hand side of the screen here, uh, that th they, they say, well, in the 1970s, corporate culture became a buzzword and historians were uniquely um, able to uh, deal with the nuances of corporate culture. Don't think I particularly buy that because there's, there's lots of business school graduates at the same time who uh, are, have that, that same degree of facility. They make the same arguments about brand. Suddenly brand becomes important and historians uh, are, 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 this idea of heritage management is very, very useful in, in connecting uh, history with uh, external stakeholders, particularly consumers and particularly in a retail kind of environment like, like Coca-Cola. The economists will say, no, it's just a bad job market for historians. They've overproduced historians. They need to be employed in other areas. And suddenly you have historians that uh, get PhDs. They cannot get jobs in state colleges. There are stories in, in uh, some of the state colleges in, in uh, New York that uh, by 1980 say that they have not hired a new faculty member in 20 years. Uh, because those positions are all filled. They were filled at the end of the Second World War, and th there just isn't any more room. Meanwhile, the, the, the uh, academic factory is pumping out PhDs in history. That has an element of it, and so you now start seeing uh, new forms of history being developed as these unemployed historians moving into different contexts. And I'll, I'll explain in a second what I mean by that. How did the professional historians react well, not well, to this idea that, that they have a competitor that exists in the context of a corporation. Um, they, they say there, there must be something wrong with someone that would take that kind of, of position. So, and I apologize for the small writing here. Uh, one reaction, uh, uh, this uh, came out in a statement in the 1980s, the corporate historian is clearly of a subordinate nature, best suited for failed PhDs who have failed to scale the ivied walls of teaching. Another reaction is, will history, and, and there's, there's always the, the, the claims that being in a corporate social context is going to bastardize or compromise the, the objectivity of, of the historian. So uh, the then president of the American Historical Association questions them. He says, will the historians, will those historians employed by corporations be allowed full honesty and integrity? Can they maintain professional objectivity without being corrupted or influenced by the organization? Can they express criticism of the company without fear or rebuke? 
Uh, another phrase, in the marketplace, the pressures for ethical compromise are greater than in the academy, though of course they exist there as well. Our principal ob obligation, academic historians, is very simple, to tell the truth insofar as we are able. So, so the traditional academic historians are wrapping themselves in this essence of objectivity, saying that these guys are selling out, they're moving to a different context, and they are going to lose their professional integrity because they are not objective. And the real question is, where were the academic uh, 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 historians themselves as objective as they think they were? And um, I think the answer to that is, is uh, actually no. But to understand what's going on here and the reaction of the, the traditional uh, uh, historians uh, to this context uh, or this, this phenomenon, you have to understand the uh, sociology of professions, and Andy Abbott uh, argues that professions exist in hierarchies, in status orders, in ecologies that, that feed into each other. There is always going to be this competition, this tension between different occupational categories for status and hierarchy, and that's, that's precisely how the professions work. In fact, if you see this, this, uh, this argument of professionals moving into organizations, uh, there is a consistent theme in the sociology of professions that says that there is something inherently um, conflicting about having a professional work inside a bureaucracy. And the, the uh, category of this research is called organizational conflict. They tended to look at uh, primarily lawyers and accountants that move into into uh, corporations and say, well, they, they're, they're, they're not happy, they don't work very well, and they have more ethical violations there. Interesting fact, though, the early studies of, of organizational conflict supported this notion when those were done in the 1970s. By the 1990s, those numbers were not quite the same. In fact, it looked as though pretty well inside the corporations. And by 1995, ASQ publication on organizational or, or professional conflict says, you know, actually this isn't really working out. We're going to call it the adaptation thesis now because professionals have adapted pretty well to the corporate context. So it depends when you study this. And I suspect that in the context of corporate historians, the same sort of adaptation is going to take place over, over time. The other interesting phenomena that you have here is that the dominant profession in the context of the legal world uh, were, were, were the lawyers who always held accountants in disdain because accountants and moved into the, the corporate sphere. Flash forward 20 years later, and, and, and of course accountants had complete social closure. They have not got the, the sort of state protection. So if you want to call yourself a lawyer and you're not a lawyer, you're going to get sued and, 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 and you're going to pay a very, very hefty fine. If you want to be an accountant and call yourself an accountant but you don't have the proper degree, it doesn't matter because the, 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 the title of accountants is not protected. And the reason is that they've never achieved the same degree of social closure the, the, the regulatory bargain with the state that gives them that degree of pr protection or that degree of monopoly. But it doesn't matter because, because they never got this degree of social closure, the accounts that move to corporations are actually doing much better than most lawyers. And if you look at the transnational flow of professionals now, accounting is, much more, is a much more globalized profession than law is. Why? because law as a profession attached its professional project to the nation state. And the nation state doesn't like to have you move around because their laws are pretty much fixed. The accountants who attach their professional project to the corporation are very, very globalized and very, very successful as a result because we live in a globalized world. This is this intimate connection that I'm very, very interested in uh, between professional projects and, and institutionalization projects. And I think they always go together, but they have to mutually adapt to each other as they move through these, these situations. I think the prospect long term for the corporate historian is very, very good. The only thing that's different is that the context of history, as we understand it, will change very, very substantially as that, that uh, professional occupation moves from one institutional context to another. So the real question then becomes, um, how is 
going to change in what context. And I think we have some clues or some suggestions of that. But I want to go back before we do that and, and address this question about the academic historians and their uh, highly moralized claims of, of objectivity. Are, are, they, are academic, academic historians actually professionalized? Well, they're not professionalized in the same way that accountants aren't professionalized. They don't have the degree of social closure. Anyone can call themselves a historian. And in fact, there are very, very good, very, very successful amateur historians who don't have PhDs. However, if you want an affiliation in the dominant institution, which is the university, you darn well have to have a PhD. So there is some degree of licensure, licensure there, is some degree of accreditation and uh, a high amount of, of credentialing in that system. What is the professional project of the academic historian? Well, if you ask them, they'll give you this sanctimonious answer. Objectivity. That's what our professional project is. But that has been challenged lately by historians themselves who would say, no, because they have attached professional project to the university which exists within the nation state. The content of which they, they study is really male, it's really Caucasian or Western European in, in its way. And it really focuses on great men theories of wars and conflicts between nation states. That really constitutes the subject matter of the academic historian. And what gets left out of that are histories of race, histories of gender, histories of local relations. And it's only round about the 1980s, at the same time that we see corporations starting to develop this new occupational category, we also see uh, erosion in the protection of the academic history. This is particularly pronounced in the context of race and gender. And Gerda Lerner, uh, who by 1981 has assumed the presidency of the Association of American Historians, starts to comment on this in her presidential address. And she says, you know, it's interesting that the taken us this long for women who have not worked typically. Women PhDs in history could not get jobs in academic institutions, but they continued to maintain their professional project outside the confines of, the, of, of that institutional context. And as a result of that, they're, they're able to explore areas that are excluded from this particular professional project. And she acknowledged in her speech the existence of female historians who, quote, treasured and collected the records and documents of female histor history without the support of a protective institution i.e. The, the, the university. So what we start to see happening is that the claims of objectivity uh, of the traditional academic professional historians start to break down. And they break down with the emergence of new types of history out there that have been excluded by the institution. Gender, ethnic history, local history, history of race. All of this stuff starts to emerge out. And ultimately becomes legitimated, le legitimated as the uh, academic historians get under in increasing pressure. Actually, Marxist history gets excluded primarily from American universities, not, uh, not from European ones. You also see around 1981 these arguments about the overproduction of, uh, of, of historians. So these are quotes taken from the Wall Street Journal and uh, New York Times. The bottom one, the New York Times, says academic historians are producing monographs of analytication, methodological ele elegance on ever smaller and more manageable topics in an effort to emulate science. The professional historian in his research and writing has begun to speak to an ever narrow group of scholars, mostly other academic historians and graduate students. That time you also have the emergence of the popular historian uh, who also gets denigrated and criticized by uh, academic historians. Uh, the American Association of Historians in 1982 acknowledges that they are a profession in crisis. And the Wall Street Journal 1981 says that the getting a PhD in history actually has a negative value because you're you're simply not going to get a job. So you have these economic pressures going on. At the same time, the discourse starts to challenge the core idea of what this profession is all about. Um, that, in a short, is the answer of why that seems to have occurred in the early 1980s. Uh, you have, of course, the, 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 the uh, concomitant phenomenon of corporation now suddenly feeling its, its oats as a dominant 
institution. So I want to I just very briefly, and I know I'm out of time, and I'll finish very, very quickly here. Um, I, wa I want to speculate a little bit about what history is going to look like in the con when it starts being produced by the corporation rather than, than the university. It's going to tend to different actors. We see that in, in the way that history itself in traditional academic contexts has changed. It will also attend to different conceptions of time. I'll explain what I mean by that. And, and, and the content, the absolute content of history is going to be very, very different. This is again Gerda Lerner, the, the um, president uh, then of the American Historical Association. And, and she acknowledges that as history moves to different institutional contexts, it always produces different subject matters, different actors in a, in a socially constructivist way. She says it might be well to remember that the written history is of, it, is, is of itself a historical creation which arose with the emergence of ruling elites. From the time of the king lists of Babylonia and Assyria, uh, on historians, whether priests, royal servants, clerks, or clerics, or, or a professional class of university trained intellectuals, have usually ordered the past within a frame of reference that supported the values of the ruling elite, of which they themselves were a part. I think that same argument will apply to the context of uh, history produced in the, in the context of the corporation. So uh, management history, the history of specific individual corporations, the history of economics, uh, my prediction will be the core matter of history as opposed to the great men of politics or the great men of the, of the nation state as it was in the past. The other important distinction is that historians, when, when history was produced by the academic historians under their claims of objectivity, was an attempt to live history context that it occurred. That is, uh, you, you did not try and, if you wanted to be a truly objective historian, you did not try and view the past through the present. Uh, you tried to immerse yourself in the past to understand it in your own right. I think that's going to change very, very dramatically in the context of the corporation. I get that from our interview data from uh, what it is that, that uh, the, the, the historians actually do. Um, in, in contrast to striving for an objective understanding of the, the temporal context, they engage in what we describe as rhetorical history. They, they often describe themselves as storytellers who understand that they, they can't make up stuff, although some of them have. They will use that as the raw material to construct stories that will enhance the context of the corporation that they work for. And in this context, they're drawing from a, a, long, uh, a, a long list of studies in invented traditions that say that, yeah, what institutions are really good at is making use of history to give them a sense of endurance and continuity that they probably never actually had. And those of you interested in that, I encourage you to read Hobbes, Baum, and Ranger, who talk about, in an edited book, the variety of strategies that the British monarchy has always done things the way that they do, that change doesn't really happen. It gets muted out by the stories of history uh, that, that they, they tell. And, and finally, there is going to be a very, very kind of different history that's, that's taken place. There's going to be a shift away from the scientific positivist notions of history. And uh, there, there will be increased attention to the idea of history as a, as a narrative function. And I, again, as I, s I say, many of these folks call themselves uh, storytellers rather than, than historians in, in the corporation. I have to say that th this is not without its dark side. Uh, a couple of uh, German companies uh, with their histories uh, have, have tried to play games with uh, who they are and, and what they do. Uh, Volkswagen was uh, about to celebrate its, its anniversary and they shifted its founding date conveniently until uh, after the war ended so that it didn't look as though they had any association with Nazis. Bertelsmann, same thing. Both of them got caught out by academic history and have uh, since both funded foundations that, that will uh, pay for historians to write uh, objective histories. So the, there is certainly a dark side there, and it's not an anything goes sort of attitude, but it's pretty clear that when you move from one institutional space to another, um, a lot of things can change. And I'll stop there. Thanks very much.